right, so why don't we um, get uh, started before introducing our speaker today? I wanted to remind you of the events at the center in the coming days and weeks. On Fridays, there is no lunchtime talk, but we have the second lecture in the annual lecture series, which will be given by Kaylin O'Connor from uh, LPS Irvine. And Kaylin will be talking about why natural social contracts are not fair. The next lunchtime talk on Tuesday at noon will be taking place at the center. And it will be, it will be given by a uh, center fellow, uh, Andrew Cooper, who will be talking about induction as action, resolving the problem of UL idealism. So uh, we hope to see uh, uh, many of you at these events. Uh, both talks, the Friday uh, lecture and uh, uh, Tuesday lecture will also be streamed on YouTube as are nearly all our, our talks. Today, it's my uh, great uh, pleasure to, inter to introduce our uh, speaker, Agnès, Agnès Bolinska. Um, she, Agnès, this is part of the series that we created a few years ago called Feature, uh, Former Featured Fellows, or Featured Former Fellows, I guess, FFF, where we bring back people who have spent a semester or a year at the center to hear uh, about their uh, to listen to their work, to their recent work. Uh, Agnès is currently an, an assistant professor at the University of uh, South Carolina. She got her PhD in 2015 from the University of Toronto. Uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center uh, for Philosophy of Science here in uh, 2016. And for three years, she's been working at the University of South Carolina. She works mostly on scientific models and modeling with a focus on biology, molecular biology and structural biology in particular. But she's done actually a lot of other works on other topics. Um, she's worked uh, on the methodology of case study in history and philosophy of science, so some work in metaphilosophy of uh, uh, related to philosophy of science. She also has a paper that touches on a touchy topic here at Pitt, and I'll just give the title, A Monist Proposal Against Integrative Pluralism About Protein Structure, recently published in Erkenntnis, uh, which I, I actually highly uh, recommend. She's published in all the best journals, studies, Erkenntnis, biology and, philo and philosophy, synthesis, and, and others. So it's really a pleasure to, uh, uh, to welcome, you, welcome you back. And uh, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Edward, for that really lovely introduction. And thank you, everyone else, for coming today. So the paper I'm presenting today is actually co-authored with Andre Shali, who is a structural biologist at UCSF. And it's about a particular kind of modeling practice in structural biology called integrative modeling and what it can teach us about integrative research more generally. And I'm really happy to have the opportunity to present it here in this venue because it builds on work that I was doing while I was at a, a postdoc at the center. So there is now a broad literature describing the nature of integrative research in various domains and especially in biology. And lots of case studies of the integration of multiple data explanations and methods. So for example, there's a special issue in studies on introduction in biology. But what's missing from this literature is a detailed description of how integration takes place or what precisely it consists in. Instead, a lot of these case studies are presented at a relatively coarse grain. So for example, Anya Plutinsky discusses the integration of data in the study of carcinogenesis. And she writes that familial data was integrated with subsequent work on the rates and character of retinal development but doesn't further describe what is meant by integrating data in this case. Similarly, Sabina Leonelli suggests that new data types, such as data about how misganthus behaves in the field, can be usefully integrated with data about Arabidopsis metabolism. But she also doesn't specify further what it is that plant scientists are actually doing when they integrate this data. Second, authors in this literature tend to describe cases of integrative research, but not to offer normative guidance for how to conduct such research effectively. But having these things, having a detailed description of what integration consists in and how to conduct integrative research effectively is important. The value of integrative research has been 
widely acknowledged, but that value hinges on integrative research being conducted effectively and our understanding of how exactly it takes place. So a task for philosophers is to explain why it's valuable. That is, we need to examine the mechanics of effective integration. So to that end, today my aim will be to provide a detailed descriptive and normative account of integration using this practice of integrative structure modeling as a case study. So here's a plan for the talk. I'll begin with a detailed description of the aims and workflow of integrative modeling. Then I'll propose heuristics for conducting integrative modeling effectively. That will be the normative proposal of the talk. And finally, I'll conclude by highlighting some parallels between integrative modeling and research in other domains. We think that at a certain level of description, the problems that modelers face in the context of structural biology is common to integrative research elsewhere. And so one thing we wanna do is ask what we might learn from integrative modeling about integrative research more broadly, although this final part of the talk is suggestive and represents an avenue for future work. Okay, so let's begin with the aims. Structural biologists are interested in determining the structures of biomolecular systems, anything from DNA and protein to larger complexes like the ones pictured here. And by structure, we mean the positions and orientations of components of, of these uh, larger structures. How do they determine them? Well, first of all, they have a variety of different experimental techniques, each of which can give them clues about what the structures will look like. These techniques vary with respect to the kind of information they can give about a structure and the resolution they're able to provide. And they each have particular limitations. So for example, X-ray crystallography is capable of providing atomic resolution structures, but molecules have to first be isolated and crystallized to be subjected to this technique. So it's not capable of providing information about molecular dynamics or interactions with other molecules, which is something that in contrast solution NMR spectroscopy is able to do. In addition to experimental techniques, structural biologists also have at their disposal various theoretical techniques. So for example, ab initio protein structure prediction methods attempt to predict a folded protein structure from its primary sequence alone. Many of these techniques rely on prior models, which are housed in the protein data bank, an online repository for both experimentally determined and computed structure models. So the problem of molecular structure determination requires information from multiple experimental and theoretical sources. But each of these pieces of information only offers a partial picture of structure. This is especially the case as biologists aim to determine larger and more complex structures. So in the early days of structural biology, the aim was to determine static structures of molecules that were relatively small. So things such as myoglobin, which is the left image here. Contemporary structural biologists can determine structures of systems like the nuclear pore complex, this middle image, which is orders of magnitude larger and more complex than myoglobin. And a future goal of structural biology is to produce dynamic representations of whole cells. So whereas a single method may well be sufficient for smaller, simpler systems, for larger complex dynamic systems, we certainly need information from multiple sources. Now, some pieces of information constrain structural models more reliably than others, where a piece of information is reliable to the extent that we can be confident that it constrains structural models correctly. And that's because information is subject to several sources of uncertainty. So first of all, information can be sparse in the sense that there can be more degrees of freedom in the model than there are, than there are data points. And as a result, the information underdetermines under the model. And there's a risk of overfitting the data if sparseness isn't given due consideration. Second, information is subject to random and systematic error. 
And third, it can be ambiguous with respect to what it indicates about a structure. In other words, there can be multiple interpretations of the structure based on a given piece of information. Finally, there are many possible ways to integrate available information and different models will accommodate different pieces of information to different degrees. And I'd, I'd like to illustrate this last point using a historical example. In the mid 20th century, Sir Lawrence Bragg, John Kendrew and Max Perutz attempted to solve the problem of polypeptide chain folding. And they published a paper proposing a structure for the folded polypeptide chain that appeared before Linus Pauling's famous alpha helix. They had at their disposal a bunch of different information. In particular, they knew the bond lengths and atoms in the polypeptide chain. And they also had a particular X-ray diffraction photograph, which was taken by William Astbury at Leeds. And this photo was widely interpreted as indicating that protein would have a subunit that repeated every 5.1 angstroms. The structure that Bragg, Kendrew, and Perutz ended up proposing accommodated information from this photograph in the sense that it had a 5.1 angstrom rise, which is what the photograph seemed to indicate. But they missed something important. Due to a phenomenon known as resonance, the peptide bond, which is typically depicted in structural formulae as a single bond, actually has partial double bond character. So rotation about this bond is prohibited, but the structure Bragg, Kendrew, and Perutz proposed actually allowed rotation about the peptide bond. In other words, their proposed structure accommodated information from Asprey's X-ray diffraction photograph. It had this 5.1 angstrom rise, but it failed to accommodate information from chemical theory. In contrast, the alpha helix that Pauling proposed, which was the correct structure for the folded poly polypeptide chain, accommodated information from chemical theory, but not from Asprey's photograph. It did not permit rotation about the peptide bond, but it had a 5.4 angstrom rise rather than a 5.1 angstrom rise as, as seemed to be indicated by the photograph. So the problem is that we have all of these pieces of information that each give us a partial picture of what the structure looks like, where some pieces of information are more reliable than others. And the challenge is how to bring all of them together, how to integrate them into a model of biomolecular structure. But there are many ways to do this with different models accommodating different pieces of information to different degrees. So here's where integrative modeling comes in. Integrative structure modeling is a method for constructing a structural model by appropriately considering different types of information with varying reliability. So it's a particular way in which information from diverse sources can become integrated. So I'd like to now turn our attention to the integrative modeling workflow. In other words, I'd like to describe how this process actually takes place in practice. Here's an overview. We begin with a bunch of information. Again, it can come from theoretical or empirical sources. Model construction proceeds in three steps defining the model representation, constructing a scoring function, and searching for acceptable models. The result is a model ensemble, which is then analyzed, and the whole process has to typically be iterated multiple times. So what I'm gonna do now is describe these steps in detail so you can get a feel for how this process works. Although integrative modeling is a contemporary technique, the general principles upon which it relies are also in play in historical cases. So I'll sometimes use historical examples to illustrate these steps. And the aim of going through these steps again is to describe the mechanics of integration in this context. I'll show that each step of modeling can be informed by different pieces of information. And so integration in the context of integrative structure modeling amounts to deciding where and how to use different pieces of, of information. Okay, so let's begin with the first step of integrative modeling, 
which is to define the model representation. Defining the model representation involves specifying the variables whose values are to be determined by modeling. Often what structural biologists are after are atomic coordinates. So in that case, the model representation would include the X, Y, and Z coordinates for every atom, but not always. So for example, in the late 1940s, when Watson and Crick were working on the problem of DNA structure, DNA was known to consist of either two or three polynucleotide chains, which each contained a sugar phosphate backbone and four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And as is well known, in order to determine the DNA structure, Watson and Crick constructed physical models from pieces that represented the known constituents of DNA. So rather than trying to determine atomic coordinates, their aim was to determine how larger components of the DNA structure fit together. So the model representation that they defined, again, the variables whose values were to be determined by modeling, were the positions of these larger components. Now, in defining the model representation, modelers can take some information into account. So for example, in choosing to construct models with bases that had these particular shapes, Watson and Crick took into, the account, into account the information that the bases in fact had these particular shapes, not some other shapes. Note that this isn't trivial, um, not all information is used in this step. So for instance, this famous X-ray diffraction photograph of DNA taken in Rosalind Franklin's lab uh, conveys this X pattern that can be interpreted as containing the information that DNA was a helix with a particular rise. And this information doesn't yet enter the picture when defining the model representation. In other words, it's not used to determine the pieces from which the model will be constructed. Defining the model representation creates a space of possible structures consisting of all of the possible values that each variable can take on. So to illustrate what this looks like, consider a very simple example. Imagine that all we wanted to know were the X and Y coordinates of just a single atom. The space of possible structures would then consist of all permutations of X and Y values. That is any point on this two dimensional plane would be considered a possible model for this structure. The next step would be to, to determine how well each of the models in this space accommodates all of the available information. And we can do this by constructing a function that scores each model on this basis. Most commonly, a least square scoring function is used corresponding to a weighted sum of spatial restraints where the sum runs over all spatial restraints i. xi is the value of a restrained spatial feature in a model. xi naught is its measured value. And omega i is the weight of the restraint. So for example, a restraint i based on an NMR spectrum may compare the distance between two specific atoms in a model xi with an experimental observation that this distance is say less than 4.5 angstroms. That would be the xi naught value weighted by our relative confidence in the measurement omega i. If we sum over all such restraints weighted according to our relative confidence in them, we get the value for the scoring function s. Now in effect, the scoring function generates a scoring function landscape. But this landscape isn't given to us automatically. So the third step of modeling is to map the shape of the scoring function landscape. And in particular, to search the space of possible models for those that accommodate all of the information sufficiently well. In principle, the best search is a systematic enumeration that, enu that generates every possible model one by one with sufficient granularity but this is rarely computationally feasible. And so stochastic sampling methods, such as various Monte Carlo schemes can be used instead. These methods rely on heuristics that bias the search toward models that are more likely to be acceptable without having to enumerate all models. So one thing that modelers can do in addition to using these kinds of methods 
is to take certain information into account in order to limit the searching step. So here's an example. In mapping the structure of the nuclear pore complex, which I mentioned already earlier, uh, and which is this channel that's embedded in the nuclear membrane that mediates the exchange of small ions. One piece of information that modelers had was that the NPC had an eightfold symmetry, which is depicted here on this, in this image on the right. So rather than searching the whole structure for acceptable models, modelers could search only one of these symmetry units and assume that they were replicated in this way. The aim of this process is to generate an ensemble of acceptable models, those that satisfy input information sufficiently well as quantified by the scoring function. I should also mention that the models in the ensemble should be sufficiently precise for answering biological questions. Here, we're not talking about that so much because we're more interested in how well they accommodate different pieces of information, but that is an important qualification. So just to give you the sense of what an ensemble of models is, this is something that's already present in Solution NMR, where often several structures most consistent with the data are overlaid. So here's an example of a single such structure on the left and an ensemble on the right. Now, because every model in the ensemble satisfies input information sufficiently well, there is no principled reason to choose between them. Instead, modelers consider the model ensemble rather than any individual instance of a model in the ensemble as the model. And the variability between the models in the ensemble is a measure of the model precision. So the final step of modeling is to analyze the ensemble of, of, of models rather. Analysis includes a statistical test of the thoroughness of sampling, as well as an assessment of model precision. But what's most important for our purposes is that models are validated by determining how, how consistent they are with information used and information not used in model construction. The four-step process is iterated if no acceptable models are found or if the ensemble of acceptable models is insufficiently precise. So, in describing this workflow of integrative modeling, what we've done is put forward a picture of the mechanics of integration in this context. We're doing something more than just saying that information from say X-ray crystallography becomes integrated with information from solution NMR. Rather, we're, we're showing that integration takes place in a particular way, namely via this four-step iterative process. We've also shown that each step of modeling can be informed by different pieces of information and integrating that information amounts to deciding where and how to make use of it. So it's imperative that these decisions be made in a principled way. And I'd like to now turn to our normative proposal, which is to introduce heuristics for effective integrative modeling. And I'd like to begin by saying a little bit about how we're going to understand effectiveness in this context. So we saw that decisions about how to conduct each step of the modeling process will affect which models are constructed. Different models will result from different such decisions. For a typical modeling problem, it would take more time and computational resources than are available to combine and recombine information in every possible permutation to see which models would result and evaluate them. In other words, there's a limit to how many such permutations can even be considered. And so it's crucial that integrative modeling be conducted efficiently. In other words, by making best use of time and other resources. Now, one thing I wanted to note is that efficiency can sometimes have negative connotations indicating that corners were cut or that the investigation wasn't as rigorous as it might have been. What we're concerned with here is maximizing the efficiency of rigorous investigations con conducted according to explicit standards. Now, in our paper, we outline a number of different heuristics for maximizing efficiency in this sense. But today I'm gonna to focus on answering just one question 
which is how should information be distributed among the steps of modeling to minimize the number of iterations required to obtain an ensemble of acceptable models. And we'll show that information should be distributed as follows. So first of all, the representation and searching steps should rely on the most reliable information. Moderately reliable information should be used in scoring and unreliable information should be used in analysis. So let's begin with defining the model representation. As we've seen, modelers can take some information into account in this step. Here, only the most reliable information should be used. And that's because defining the model representation specifies a space of prima facie possible models. And so the more unreliable the information used to inform the model representation, the greater the risk that the right model will not even be included in the space of possible models, right? So imagine that Watson and Crick built models out of pieces that had the wrong shapes. Well, they'd be um, doomed from the get-go to finding the wrong model. Other information is used in scoring as spatial restraints in the scoring function. This information can be less reliable since the weighting factor omega enables the reliability in the information to be quantified. And so the idea here is that less reliable information can place less stringent constraints on which qual models qualify as acceptable. This is a good place to include certain experimental data where data, data of lower quality can be assigned a lower weight. And what this effectively means is that models are penalized less for not accommodating that data. So for example, this low resolution cryo-EM data from a 1997 study of the yeast spindle pole body was used to construct the scoring function in a more recent study. As with using information in the first step of modeling, the information that's used to guide searching should also be reliable. So for example, by using information about the symmetry of the NPC in the searching step, modelers preclude the possibility of finding models that don't have this particular symmetry. So it's really important that they get this right. We can also understand the error that Bragg, Kendrew, and Perutz made that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk as using the wrong information to inform their search process. So earlier I mentioned that the structure that they proposed was compatible with information from Asprey's X-ray diffraction photograph, but incompatible with information from chemical theory since it allowed rotation about the peptide bond. So how did they arrive at the structure? Well, their strategy was to list all, stru all structures that were compatible with Asprey's photograph and choose from among them the structure that was mostly, most likely to be correct. One way to understand what they were doing is as using information from the photograph to guide their search process. Instead of enumerating all prima facie possible ways in which the polypeptide chain could fold, they restricted their search to those compatible with information from this photograph. Now, in contrast, we can understand what Linus Pauling was doing um, as using information from chemical theory to restrict his search process. So Pauling, when he was sick in bed in 1948 and, and confined to bed rest, um, decided to tackle this problem of polypeptide chain folding. And he was in bed, so he did so by drawing out the structure of the polypeptide chain on a piece of paper and then folding and refolding it along the peptide bonds in order to search the space of, of possible structures by trying out different pitches for the helix. And as I mentioned earlier, the structure that he got uh, was incompatible with Asprey's photograph. It had a, a the, the helix he, he proposed had, had a 5.4 angstrom rise, um, which is contrary to what the photograph indicated. Um, but it didn't, it was compatible with chemical theory. Because of the incompatibility with Asprey's photograph, he didn't immediately publish his, his structure. Um, but eventually an explanation for the apparent incompatibility with the photograph was found, 
Uh, it turned out that multiple alpha helices can be coiled around one another like strands on a rope, what's known as a coiled coil tertiary structure of protein. And this higher order structure was responsible for the particular reflection in Asprey's photograph. Again, the upshot here, as in the case of using the eightfold symmetry of the NPC for searching, is that only the most reliable information should be used in guiding this step. So finally, when we have extremely low confidence in some information, it can be left out of model construction altogether and instead reserved for analysis. The NUP84 complex is a component of the nuclear pore complex that I mentioned earlier. And one of the pieces of information that researchers modeling this complex had was data from X-ray crystallography, which suggested particular interfaces between proteins in the complex, in the complex which in these images are differentiated from one another by different colors. Now, the problem with using this data to determine the structure of this complex was that it was unclear whether or not it could be extrapolated to the complex's native environment. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, X-ray crystallography requires the isolation and crystallization of proteins, and this can affect their structure. So researchers in this case were skeptical about whether the crystallographic interfaces between these proteins reflected how they came together in their native environment. The proteins could come together in the same way, but they might not. Given this uncertainty, it was unclear to them what conclusions they were warranted in drawing about the structure from this data. So they didn't use it to construct their models, and instead they reserved it for analysis. What doing so does is it makes the construction of models that are inconsistent with unreliable information possible. And if models are then found not to be consistent with that information, well, we have already an explanation, which is that there's a problem with the information rather than with the models. But something interesting can happen as well, which is that information used for analysis can turn out to be consistent with the models that are constructed in the first three steps. And in this kind of case, the reliability of that information used for analysis can be increased and it can be used to inform model construction in subsequent iterations. And this is indeed what happened in the case of the NUP84 complex. In the analysis step, the interfaces revealed by X-ray crystallography were approximately re reproduced in the model. And this resemblance of the model to the crystallographic interfaces increased the reliability of that piece of information. It turned out that inferences from the crystallographic context to the in vivo structure were in fact warranted. And that in turn justified the inclusion of this piece of information as a constraint in model construction in subsequent iterations. This resulted in a more precise model. So the top images here represent the model that was constructed without the crystallographic data, whereas the bottom images represent the refined model um, that was the result of using this data in subsequent iterations. Okay, so to summarize this section, we propose the following heuristics for how to distribute information among the steps of modeling. The representation and searching steps impose the most stringent constraints on which models can be found. So only the most reliable information should be used for those steps. Since the scoring function enables the quantification of uncertainty, moderately reliable information should be used for scoring. And finally, unreliable information should be used for analysis where it cannot affect model construction. So now that we have a detailed description of the mechanics of integration, as well as a normative proposal for how to conduct inter integrative modeling effectively, I'd like to conclude with some reflections on what we might be able to learn from this case study about other kinds of integrative research. 
So we started off by articulating the problem of determining molecular stru structure, which is that there is a lot of information available from various experimental and theoretical sources, but each piece of information only offers a partial picture of structure. And what's more, some pieces of information are more reliable indicators of structure than others. And different models will accommodate different pieces of information to different degrees. So there's a problem of uh, how to choose among a multitude of prima facie possible models. Notice that these features of biomolecular structure determination are also common in other domains. So integrative research typically must take into account information from multiple empirical and theoretical sources. Each piece of information will furnish a constraint on whatever model, theory, or explanation is sought by researchers. And some pieces of information will be more reliable than others. They'll be more important to accommodate. What's more, no model theory or explanation will equally account for all information. Some models or theories or explanations um, will take into account certain pieces of information, but not others, whereas other models, theories, or explanations will, will have different pieces of information that they're able to explain. So researchers must decide how to integrate all available information. One thing they could do in principle would be to combine and recombine all of the in information into different permutations over and over again until they got the right model theory or explanation. But given various pragmatic limitations, um, this is typically impossible. So what we need is a principled way of prioritizing some ways of integrating information over others. And in particular, we need to answer the question, which pieces of information ought to be prioritized? And what does it mean in practice to prioritize these pieces of information? How does that work, that prioritization process? The mechanics of integrative modeling that I've proposed here show us how we might be able to answer these questions. So we've shown that integrative modeling is a four-step iterative process and that each of the steps of modeling can be informed by different pieces of information at our disposal. So integration in the context of integrative modeling amounts to deciding where and how to use these different pieces of in information. By describing the mechanics of integration in integrative modeling, what we've done here is to offer one concrete example of what precisely integration consists in in a particular domain. And a task for future work is to develop further such examples in other domains, perhaps determining what features they might have in common. We've also introduced heuristics for effective integrative modeling, suggesting that the most reliable information should be used for representation and searching, that moderately reliable information should be used for scoring, and that the most unreliable information should be used in analysis. The upshot of this proposal is that heuristics for effective integration require us, first of all, to assess the reliability of information, and second, to allow information to constrain solutions to research problems in accordance with its reliability such that the most reliable information places the most stringent constraints on possible solutions. Now, that might strike you as obvious. Of course, we have to assess the reliability of information, and of course, reliable information should more stringently constrain possible solutions. But if we recall the case of Bragg, Kendrew, and Perutz's mistaken structure for the folded polypeptide chain, we can see how this kind of process can go awry. Asprey's photograph, first of all, was blurry, and in general, X-ray diffraction photographs only provide partial information about a structure. 
And what's more, for any piece of experimental data, there are many possible interpretations of that data, uh, whether they're all on the table or not. In contrast, if we were to find a structure that violated chemical principles, that would be the kind of thing that would initiate some kind of revolution. It would require a fundamental revision to chemical theory. So it would be highly unlikely. So the point here is that reflecting on these kinds of points um, can give researchers heuristics for effective integration. My point here isn't to um, settle the historical case one way or the other, but rather just, just to show that these meta-level reflections can be helpful. So making explicit these heuristics for effective in integration therefore has the potential to affect scientific practice, eliminating some ad hocness and making the research more principled. A perhaps surprising upshot of our analysis is that even very unreliable information can nonetheless be useful. As we saw in the example of the NUP84 complex, um, what was first unreliable data from X-ray crystallography could be used in model construction in subsequent iterations of modeling after it was found to be compatible with models that were produced only on the basis of other information. In other words, if we combine some of the information in a particular way, that itself can give us new information that we previously didn't have, which is that extrapolation from the crystallographic to the in vivo context in this case was warranted. And that new information in turn could be used to generate more precise models. So in other words, when we integrate information in this way, we make best use of the information that we have at our disposal. Finally, the integrative modeling workflow offers us a concrete means of implementing these heuristics, and it too has analogs in other domains. In any domain, researchers must decide what constitutes a solution to their research problem. That decision might take the form of determining the variables whose values they hope to find, which is the case in integrative modeling. But more generally, it means deciding things like how detailed a solution they seek and what aspects of the question it should target. Second, researchers must evaluate different candidate solutions to their research problem with respect to how well they account for or are compatible with different pieces of information. This evaluation might not always be explicit, and if it is, it may not be quantitative as it is in the case of the scoring function. Nevertheless, it has to take place in one form or another. Third, any research problem has a space of possible solution, solutions which has to be narrowed down. And again, this is something that maybe isn't made explicit, but it's something that happens. And so it's imperative that the space be narrowed down effectively. Finally, some form of analysis of candidate solutions to a research problem takes place, and much of integrative research is also iterative. So given these analogs, we think that our heuristics for how to distribute information among the steps of integrative modeling may be extendable to other domains. Now, detailing precisely how this would take place is beyond the scope of this paper, but we do think it points to some fruitful directions for future work. And I'd like to close by outlining some of these directions. So one question given, to, given these analogs to research in other domains that I've just discussed would be to, de to determine whether and if so, how the concrete heuristics that we've outlined in the context of integrative modeling could be applicable elsewhere. But the, despite these analogs, um, there may well be important differences between research in integrative modeling and other integrative research. Of course, there are important differences. This is not to suggest that, that all integrative research is the same. Um, but in that case, if there are significant differences, what are some heuristics for effective integrative research in these domains? And how do they differ from the heuristics that we've proposed? 
We think that considering the mechanics of effective integration in the context of integrative modeling in conjunction with other detailed cases has the potential to illuminate more general principles governing integrative research. Thank you for your attention.